have to tell you, I was very tempted to begin my sermon with Donald Trump and all the controversy he draw to himself in the last few days. So many controversies. And then I said to myself, you probably already had more than enough of this nonsense, racism, and attacks against everyone, even babies. No, no. Instead, let us begin on a more positive note with a clip from the movie Despicable Me, the first one. And for those who do not have children or grandchildren in their lives, uh, it's, the film that, it's the film that gave us the minions. So, in a nutshell, it is the story of Mr. Gru, who is plotting the biggest heist in the history of the world. He wants to steal the moon. And to achieve his plan, he used three little orphan girls as pawn, and after he's done, he sent them back to the orphanage. And later, the evil Victor kidnaps the girl, and Gru realized that he, makes, he made a mistake. So, let us watch. Get as close in as you can! You got it! You're going to have to jump! Jump? Are you insane? Don't worry, I will catch you! You gave us back! I know, I know, and it is the worst mistake I ever made! But you have to jump now! It'll be okay. <gasps> okay, girls! Marco, I will catch you, and I will never let you go again. Not so fast! No! Let me go! <laughs> Marco! I got you. By the way, this is the best adoption movie ever. We have often heard the expression to make a leap of faith. Well, this is Pixar version of it. The girls are confronted by a very difficult decision. Can they trust a man who will let them down without any new data or information? They have to choose between relying on past experience or believing. This time, Mr. Gru really means what he says. And interestingly, Gru also has to take a leap of faith. He has to put his life in jeopardy by walking on the wire and then to jump in the void to catch Margot, literally without the safety net. And both are saved by the minion, who also put their lives on the line. I'm sure this is not how they planned the rescue, pl they planned the rescue operation, and still it worked, because everyone decided to trust each other. Everyone, despite all the odds and evidence at their disposal, they decided to have faith in one another. This morning passage from the letter to the Hebrews address this question of faith. 
some struggle with this concept because of the ways it's repeatedly used in our churches. Too often faith is presented as a synonym of orthodoxy. The faithful, meaning the good Christian, the real good Christian, are those who do not question the existence of God, dogma, the Bible, or even the minister. For them, faith is following the party line and accepted everything they are, they are told, period. And if I may, I believe they are wrong because this is not what is faith. Faith is different from theology, which is an attempt to organize, structure, and, and reason a belief system like uh, the new creed or other creeds we say in churches. Faith is also different from religion, which is about rituals, sacraments, hymns, uh, prayers. And I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than another. No, all serve their purposes. It's just that faith is something else, something a little more messy, chaotic, intermittent, and sometimes full of surprises. The 11th chapter of the letter to the Hebrew tries to tackle this eluding concept by presenting a long list of biblical characters who are considered great examples of faith. And the most prominent member of this Hall of Fame, if we may say, is Abraham, who one day left behind his extended family, his home, his security, to set out for a land that God promised to his descendant. Not even him, his descendant. Abraham had no idea what awaited him, and no guarantees regarding the multiple challenges he would face. And yet, despite all appearances, lack of certainties or anything else, probably telling him to run in another direction, Abraham believed it in God's promise, accepted to jump into this adventure that defied common sense, because somehow, deep down, he knew that God would never leave him. And this sort of God feeling is hard for us to define, to put words on. We often prefer to you examples and share stories of real people who influence us. We might think of those who help us to become more than we thought we were. We might think of parents, grandparents, or other role models who love and challenge us at the same time. We might think of all of those who worked uh, very hard as to be the people of God and invested time and energy so the next generations could continue their endeavor after they would be gone. All those individuals, what we sometimes call the communion of saints, are embodiment of what we call faith. And even if it's difficult, the, uh, the, the author of the letter to the Hebrews attempt a definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not knowing, touching, and, and analyzing the data of a latest scientific experiment. Faith is a it's a hunch. Faith is a maybe. Faith is a journey that has no beginning or end. Now, faith is the abs absence of assurance, proof, certitude. In the word of Mark Twain, faith is believing in what you know ain't so. It's believing there's something greater than us. It is believing that promises not yet fulfilled are still meaningful. F but, but faith is not easy. Oh no, it's not easy. It requires a, a considerable amount of courage, of determination, and risk-taking. 
I'm sure it's easier to be cynical, to trust only on self, accept only what we can uh, touch or what we can see. But sometimes fate required to rely on someone that could deceive us. Sometimes fate requires to let go of our desire to control everything and to trust the decision of others. Sometimes fate required to strive for the best, even in the worst of times. Sometimes faith requires to believe that God's blessing with, will outnumber the stars in the sky. Most of us struggle to remain faithful most of the time. And yet, with faith, we can remain confident that eventually everything will be okay. And maybe the greatest manifestation of faith in our life is having children. I'm serious. When we think about it rationally, no one with an ounce of sanity would do it. It's estimated that it costs $200,000 to bring a child to the age of 18. And on top of this, we're not counting the hours of sleep we lose or, or the endless arguments we're having with our children or, or uh, all the time we spend going to one activity to another. It does not make sense to have children, and yet we do have them. We do have children, and we love them. We love them deeply. We hope they will grow up, develop all sorts of gifts and abilities, and become great individuals. We have faith that despite all the problems ahead of us, we will manage, and we will be okay. And as a church that baptizes children, we also take a leap of faith. There's no obligation are put on children to come back here. We're not in coercion, shaming, and reproaches. We just made promise that the child will find her own way, her own path, and remember what has been done. So as a congregation, we'll live in faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. It, it is what helped us to see the truth hidden sometimes beneath appearances. Faith is going beyond what we know in order to discover new possibility. And faith is the ultimate promise made to us. When we baptize children, chil the children have no clue what is said. But nevertheless, the, children receive, the child receives the assurance that God loves that God's love is unconditional, even in the most difficult of time. The child received the promise that God will come and show up and say, you can jump, you can take the next step, you can hold my end, because I will never leave you down, I will never abandon you. Amen.